Greetings and uh, welcome back. Thanks for joining me again. Now I know I've been on a bit of a long break, but sometimes life gets in the way of fun stuff like this. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe now. Uh, my goal is to upload weekly, but I can't predict uh, what might take over my schedule from week to week. So be sure to subscribe so you are updated when I, when I do upload a video. So this week, I want to talk about this book, The Long Goodbye. Now this is all of Jeff Lotta's coin material by Stephen Minch and Stephen Hobbs. Now I consider this to be a must-have book for any serious coin student. So obviously you gotta have Bobo's and I would say definitely get Richard Kaufman's Coin Magic and then David Ross Expert Coin Magic, also by Richard Kaufman. So I would add this to that list of must-have books. Uh, now this is all of Jeff Lotta's coin work that they were able to compile together. Uh, there's always some tricks that are were never recorded through notes or whatever, but uh, this is all the available material from Jeff Lotta uh, that they could compile. And you have some of his different materials scattered throughout different publications and, and even in Richard Kaufman's Coin Magic book. And of course, later on in the 2000s, he was on the New York Coin Magic seminar DVD set, which has a ton of his work. But this has pretty much all of it, and more than that, uh, that has appeared in, in those publications and the DVDs. So, the main point I'm trying to say is, uh, this is a must-have book because you have all of that material in one place for you. Very convenient to study and reference back to. So just a little bit about the book itself, obviously you'll notice the dimensions are a little bit weird. Uh, it's wider than it is tall. And I talked about this with uh, Giacomo Bertini's book, also by Stephen Minch. The main advantage of that is uh, when this is laying on the table and you're studying through, you're probably going to have coins in your hand as you're following along. And this just makes it convenient so the pages aren't flopping over as you're reading. It, it'll lay flat and you can follow along with your hands full. So that's the main advantage of that. It kind of looks weird on the bookshelf because it sticks out farther than the other books, but that's okay with me. Um, so it has a dust jacket and I know some people like to set the dust jacket aside or just to keep it in good, good condition, but I usually leave mine on, but this is what it looks like without. Uh, it simply says Jeff on the cover there in his signature and the title along the spine there. So that's just so you can see the book itself. Now the book is 317 pages with eight different chapters. And along with that, in the back, uh, comes with a DVD called the Pink Purse Tape. And the reason for that title is uh, on the DVD, there's one or maybe two routines where he's using a, a pink silk purse because he forgot the coin purse he usually has. So it was jokingly named the Pink Purse Tape. And from what I can tell, this was recorded for Roger Klaus, maybe as material that would become lecture notes. I'm not sure, but he mentions Roger Klaus in the DVD, so that's a clue there. So that's a young Jeff Lotta, maybe 25 years old or so. And you can see him in action, you know, in his prime and demonstrating material right from this book. So there's about, I'd say a half dozen routines on the DVD that you can see in action and then read the description in the book. He does go through descriptions on the DVD, so you can watch the routine there and learn it and then get finer details in the book itself. For example, his slow motion coin vanish, there's a different description in the book than what you see on the DVD. And I, f I found that to be interesting because there's one part where his hands come like this wide open before he goes into the, the full sequence. But in the book, there's a different description of the move. So little things like that are fun to, you know, compare against each other. 
So like I said, this is 317 pages, eight chapters, and uh, this book came out a while ago in 2017. Uh, and I haven't seen, I don't think I've seen any reviews on it. So that's one reason why I wanted to do this video. And I wish this book came out even earlier, maybe 10 years before, because it would have helped me a lot <laughs> with my own coin magic. But at the time I, I had Richard Kaufman's coin magic and then later on I got the New York Corn Magic Seminar DVDs and that's where I became a real fan of Jeff Lotta's style and, and you can tell through his work uh, his thinking and methodologies are cool. Now one point I want to make is when you get a book like this that compiles one person's body of work you want to be able to extract something from their style. So for instance a book like Bobo's or Coin Magic by Richard Kaufman. With those, you're getting a variety of styles from many different performers and a variation from this guy and a variation from this guy, maybe on the same routine. So those kind of books allow you to pick and choose one person's style over another or this methodology over this one. But for example, Expert Coin Magic which is just David Roth's material. I'd, I'd say the main thing to study out of that is not only the routines or the slights involved, but how David Roth took a, a concept or a premise and built a routine around it. Sometimes building a routine around a prop and study how, how he did that. Because that can inspire you to create your own routine with a new prop that no one's ever seen involved with coin magic. And with Jeff Lotta, I would say what you should extract from this book is his thoughts on gimmicks and using gimmicks in unorthodox ways. And most of the time you get a copper silver coin or a shell or a copper silver brass gimmick. And your, your first tendency is to let the gimmick create the magic for you because those kind of gimmicks are almost self-working. They come apart, they go together, and that's magical in itself. But what Jeff does with gimmicks is really intelligent thinking and a lot of times not using the gimmick for what it's obviously for, but in a different way. He describes in one part how his main use for gimmicks is to clean up after doing a slight. And I pulled out four specific routines that uh, I'll talk about later, but I think these four in particular are really worth your study on this concept I, I'm just talking about. The ingenious use of gimmicks. So let's talk about more what's inside the book. What are you getting here? Again, this is 317 pages with eight chapters. Uh, there's a foreword by Jamie Ian Swiss, one of Jeff's closest friends, and you've got to read the foreword here. It's I love stuff like this, uh, well, biographies in general, because even though I'm familiar with a lot of his work from other books, you really get an intimate background from a close friend about who Jeff was and the type of magician he was. And there's quotes in here from other magicians, Mike Gallo, John Carney, David Regal, David Roth, Eric Mead. So really go through this forward before you get into the book. And uh, so chapter one is going mainly through a lot of moves and slights. Uh, but as you go into the other chapters, there's even more moves and slights that weren't weren't covered in the first chapter but so there's about 19 different slights in the first section there called concealed weapons now chapter two is all about the hang ping chen technique now the hang ping cheng is something i don't use a whole lot i've just never really liked the move you know i there's something about this the slap down thing I just don't use it for other things, so any routine involving that 
it feels out of place for me for my style but I've definitely been practicing this after studying Jeff Lotta's stuff even since the New York Coin Magic seminar DVDs because he has a style to it that makes it look fantastic normally you see a lot of people doing this where the hands trade places but Jeff Lotta is able to do the move from this distance and so this breaks down the the move in minute detail and and the thinking behind it and and how to make it look better so along with that there's let's see about six or seven routines using the hang ping chen move and that moves used throughout the book but even if you don't like that or don't even want to practice that there's plenty of other stuff in the book for you so chapter three it goes on to coins across material and there's eight routines in that section and some other uh, other slights that weren't covered in the first chapter and the first routine I told you I, I isolated four routines that I really think are worth your study the first one comes from this section CB, CSB cube it's a coins across with four different coins there's a copper coin, a silver coin, a brass coin, and then a quarter. So if you could picture four different coins going across one at a time, and then there's a kicker ending where the last coin ends up in the coin purse. This is the first example of his use of a gimmick coin that's a little unorthodox. And it's the method is just as fun as the trick itself. You know? That's what I love about magic is a lot about crafty methodology. Uh, it makes me enjoy the trick as much as the audience is enjoying it because it's fun to do and it's fun to accomplish because a lot of times we're afraid to use gimmicks because they will be discovered. But the way Jeff thinks, like I said before, he uses gimmicks in a way that clean up other slights. So. And this routine appeared in Richard Kaufman's Coin Magic, but I read it again here and it was almost like one of those moments, if you've ever pulled an old book off the shelf and gone through it again, maybe for the fifth time, you always discover a routine that maybe at the time you weren't ready for or didn't appeal to you. But now at this stage in your life, that becomes the perfect trick for you or you see it as this hidden gem that you never looked at before. This was kind of a trick like that for me that I remember reading it before, but I, I never really did it. And after reading this book again, I, I was trying to study each, each effect and absorb out of everything. And after reading it this time, I just, I sat back and kind of laughed. Like, what a cool, what a cool concept to do that. And so, moving on, chapter three is all coins across material. Now there's some variations on, uh, you know, regular coins across, three or four coins across. So CSBQ is a little bit different with four different coins, but moving on from that, you're, you're gonna see some variation on, you know, four silver half dollars going over here to here and it's mainly about different methodology. But it's important to study that and how an idea progressed and what's your favorite methodology for you. So chapter four is tricks all about or revolving around the spellbound idea routine. So there's, there's moves in here and then there's tricks that are on the surface don't appear to be like a spellbound, but they involve the concepts of changing one coin to another. So for example, there's a karate coin routine in here, uh, silver extraction routine in here, and then actual spellbound routines with some other, some other slights in here. And then chapter five is uh, transpositions. And let's see. Yeah, the second routine on my list of four, cop sill brass. Now this also appeared in Richard Kaufman's Coin Magic, but this is a routine I've done for years because 
I liked it when I read it then and I, I still like it and I still do it. And again, it's because of the use of the gimmick, this ingenious uh, thought process. So normally, when you see a copper silver brass routine, it's done with the copper silver brass gimmick. And you, it's a transposition of one coin to two other coins. But Jeff doesn't use that gimmick. He uses another gimmick, but uh, one of the transpositions is probably the coolest use for this particular gaff, not the CSB gaff, a different gaff, of an, inst an instant transposition from the silver coin to the copper and brass coin. So again, this is a routine well worth your study just for the thinking alone, even if you don't end up doing it. So moving on to chapter six, it's all wild coin routines. And the, the third routine I've gotten here is uh, trace wild, or it might be French, tray wild, I'm not sure. But again, great thinking with one gimmick here. The beauty of this routine is, unlike other wild coin routines, the audience sees three silver coins front and back, and then they see those coins change and they can see three copper coins front and back. And then it, it ends with a, an instant transformation of the three copper back to three silver. And again, those can be shown front and back. And it's all accomplished with one gimmick coin. And again, the methodology is, is well worth the study just to get you out of the mode of if, if you're afraid of gimmicks or opposed to using gimmicks, what Jeff does is think about them in a completely new way and it'll probably get you uh, wanting to practice with gimmicks. So the first one I have is CSBQ, then Cop Sill Brass, and then Trace Wild. And there's one more I'll get to. So that's chapter six, uh, Wild Coin Routines. There's four routines in that section. Chapter seven is uh, uh, all his Akito box work which is fantastic stuff. I love the Okito box and, and Jeff has some fresh approaches to not the, not the premise because all the routines are either coins arriving into the box or coins coming out of the box, but it's, it's the way he does that. That's, that's interesting. So if you love coin box work, uh, that chapter is a lot of fun to study. And just a side note, I'd say 90% of the material here uh, is done on a table, either standing or sitting. So that may or may not appeal to you, but there is stuff in here that is all in the hands or you into a spectator's hands. But just so you know, about 90% about of this material is done on the tabletop. So I was just reminded of that uh, looking at the Okito box material here. But moving on to chapter eight, uh, there's a number of routines here involving disappearances and appearances of coins. So it goes from using one coin to two to three, and you'll see his slow motion vanish in here. And the fourth routine I, I have here is uh, from the Elfin Horde, which is a, a three coin vanish and then one at a time and then a one at a time appearance of the three coins. And again, this uses a gimmick in a, in a fantastic way. And it's, I think out of, out of the four routines I pulled out, this one uses a gimmick in such an indirect way. Uh, like he says, he likes to clean up uh, from other slights using the gimmick. Instead of letting a gimmick do a slight for you. Uh, I think this is the best example of that that thinking. So from the Elfin Horde, which he later adapted to be in the hands, uh, and that's uh, a trick with three coins. It's pretty similar. That that trick is more drawn out, and there's more phases to it. But the the genesis of that was from the Elfin Horde, and that happens on the tabletop and just a great routine to study. So that's, again, CBSQ, Cop Sill Brass, Trace Wild, 
and from the Elfin Horde. I think for me, these four routines embody Jeff's thinking and and his philosophy with the gimmicks. And for me, I got out of this book, you know, uh, new methodologies and new ways of thinking. And like I was mentioning before, when you're reading someone's body of work, what, what are the main things you can take away from that style? And like I mentioned, David Roth, taking a, a weird premise to fruition to a full-fledged routine, sometimes revolving around one prop. And then you'll, you'll notice in his work, he uses a, a mirror, a sleeve, uh, a planet, the rainbow, uh, a tuning fork, things like this, where you say, how can you make coin magic out of that? So for Jeff, it's studying how did he change methodology to make a classic routine even cleaner? Or how did he take this gimmick to make something look like real magic? Even if you know about the gimmick, it's not used in the way you normally use the gimmick. So for me, those four routines really highlight that philosophy. And, uh, it's pushed my coin magic forward. So chapter eight, that's the last chapter. And another thing I really enjoyed about this book is all throughout, there's little note boxes like here, these gray boxes. And these are ex excerpts from Jeff's notes and they're also taken from different online magic forums where Jeff used to be active and commenting, answering questions. And it just gives you great insight to his ideas on presentations, practicing methodologies, creativity. And uh, a lot of them give a lot of good background on what made him the magician he was. And there's one right here talking about early inspiration when he met David Roth and he says, <clears throat> when I was 16 or 17, I was working hard through Bobo's, Buckley's, Downs, etc. I had some chops, but they were old school. Not that there's anything wrong with that. And uh, one day he was at Tannin's and that's where he met David Roth, and he just said, We didn't expect much. Then Roth unloaded both barrels right in our faces. His hands were always empty when we knew coins had to be there. Palm up, palm down, at the fingertips, at eye height, jumping around. Totally natural. Utterly convincing. Baffling. And he said, It was insane. Totally insane. Our minds were blown. I never had imagined that sleight of hand could look that good. Roth is the master. No one else's work is as clean. So it's just fun to read uh, little little bits of history like that and where he came from and who he admired. And, and I liked the very last, yeah, this very last bit on, he talks about hanging coins and, and studying the routine. And you got to remember at the time, you know, the early 80s, I'm talking about when, when Jeff was young. Things like the hanging coins, that was revolutionary magic. You know, when that came out, it was that was fresh magic. Now that's a routine that's maybe not considered a beginner material, but everyone is doing some kind of hanging coins routine. And it's been done to death and maybe too much. And he kind of he doesn't talk about that necessarily, but he talks about learning the first time learning that being frustrated about the fourth coin not vanishing, coming up with ways to accomplish that, and then finally circling back and realizing that Roth was right, and that's the perfect presentation for the trick. And it makes you reconsider stuff that you've read before or stuff that you think you've improved on. And for me, I've always been a fan of the classic coin magic and stuff done right in front of people in close proximity. And it makes you reconsider the style 
coin magic has been evolving through lately with a lot of a lot of moves, changeovers, and almost coin juggling. Uh, if, if you read and study the classics, the plots and premises are clear. There's only enough slights that are, are needed to accomplish the effect. There's not as much overproving and and all of this nonsense. So it's inspiring to read someone that I admire a lot, uh, you know, share this insight and remind me to, you know, go back to basics, reread the basics, study the basics or the classics, and do those in your own style. And if you can change one thing and it is better, then you have an improvement. And there's another part where he had more to say about that, about studying the classics. And he says, I think it's important to study the classics even if you don't wind up using them. Spending some time walking around inside the skull of someone like John Ramsey or Di Vernon will teach you more about magic than learning any particular trick ever could. After a while, you start to see the patterns and understand why they chose this method or timing and discarded that one. In a perfect world, we would all do tricks our own way. But to get there properly, you need a coherent philosophy, something these men had. It's evident in their work. You may not want to adopt their philosophy, but absorbing and understanding it will inform you and help lead you to your own. And that's the real benefit of the classics. And that's that's exactly his approach to, to these routines. A lot of these routines are not new in premise, but new in methodology and sometimes makes them look even cleaner or could make them look like a different trick. So with all that in mind and the, the four routines I extracted from here, uh, this book should be a staple in your library if you love coin magic. And I don't want to tell you you know, these four tricks are the best tricks in the book. I don't think they are. They're, I pulled them out for a specific reason for you to study the, the methodology with the gimmicks in there. And there's, there's maybe half of this stuff or over half that uses no gimmicks at all. So I don't want to misconstrue, you know, what's in this book. But for me, what I, what I pulled out of here was his thinking about gimmicks his thinking about the classics, his handling of the classics. And that's what's really important about this book. So, and this is still available from the you know, different online magic sites. I think it's about $80 and it's gonna give you years worth of study and it will help improve your coin magic. So that's it for today, guys. Uh, again, I thank you for coming back. If if you were notified of this video and came back to watch it, uh, I really appreciate it. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe so you'll get notified when I upload a new video. For the next one, I am going to do Michael Rubenstein's Coin Magic book. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein graciously sent me the book uh, to review, and I've spent all of October and I'm still going, I've gone through it and back through it, and I'm I'm still going through it because it's a massive book and I want to I want to give a good review of it. I've seen a, a couple other reviews on it and I want to give my take on it as well. So stay tuned for that video and uh, that's it for now. Thanks.